talk will have nothing to do with impersonals or with um, decision theory. Um, but of course, um, um, so it, it's been a number of um, um, uh, utterance modifiers uh, have been identified that um, um, expressions and, and words that seem to modify the elocutionary force of, of an utterance. And um, some of these uh, seem to be modifying a, a, a wide range of, of speech acts, which um, calls for a sort of unified approach to the semantics of speech acts so that we can then uh, model the utterance modifiers by having them modify the same thing, whatever that thing is. So that's, gonna, that's sort of my, my, my talk in a, in a nutshell. Um, so the first utterance modifier, actually, is it possible to turn off this particular light that's right in front of the screen? Perfect. Um, so most of my talk is going to report on joint work with Alison at Ingeroff, Maryland. Um, and um, it's going to be about uh, language I don't speak or know anything about, um, um, but she does. Um, so it's on Mandarin. Uh, utterance final particle bar. There is also uh, a sort of not utterance final use of um, a particle that is spelled and pronounced the same way, but I'm for now assuming it's a different lexical item, or maybe not, but that's for future work. Um, so we're looking at utterance final uses of bar as a discourse move modifier. Um, so you can see in the first example on the slide, if you just say go, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce Mandarin. Um, that's just a regular imperative. And it means what you think it means. Um, if you add by, it becomes um, something else depending on the context. So that's already a, a, a sign that there's going to be pragmatics involved because it, there's context variability. Um, so it could mean, if it's, if it's the first time that this going here or going somewhere is being brought up, then it becomes a suggestion, something like, how about you go? Um, if, if the hearer, for example, has been begging to be permitted to go, then this would mean something like, go if you must. Like, re okay, fine, if you really, really have to. Um, so what Bond does, it, it takes this imperative and it changes the elocutionary force of it. And I'm going to call the utterance to which by is attaching the anchor. Um, so by is also unembeddable. And we tried um, to embed it under negation questions, conditionals, under verbs of saying, under verbs of other attitude, no go. Um, it just would not embed uh, meaning wise, or in some cases, it would be just completely bad syntactically. Um, so I take it to be a speech act modifier of some kind. Um, so uh, when we started looking, uh, when Alison started looking at uh, prior literature on this particle, uh, she couldn't identify any unified function for, for this particle. Um, um, and so it became clear that we need to gather data. Um, so she collected over seven hours of Mandarin film and TV um, and extracted from them 95 tokens of ba and we carefully analyzed each example. And then we looked at larger corpora, in particular uh, the spoken portion of the Chinese <coughs> tree bank, um, and also the Chinese call home corpus, um, and identified many, many more examples that we, so many examples that we couldn't actually look at each one individually, but we extracted the important ones as a follow-up study. Um, so the initial corpus study, uh, we annotated for anchor clause type. Um, many of them we couldn't identify because things are sometimes ambiguous in Chinese. Um, but um, we found declaratives, imperatives, um, some substantial utterances. Uh, so if this, it's subclausal, we can't tell what clause type it is. Um, and then also the, the majority were morphosyntactically unmarked. Um, and we found no interrogatives with Ba in the data. In fact, uh, the, the later follow-up study of those many, many more examples showed also no interrogatives with Ba. Um, and this is significant. Um, we also looked at the direct speech act conveyed by the anchor. And we found a wide range of speech acts. We found assertions, directives, commissives, hortatives, but no questions. 
OK. So questions are, are different. And that's going to be my proposal, is that questions are a little different. Um, all right. So here's, um, we, I, I'm going to present four examples um, that are kind of the most extreme cases of um, various patterns we found. So um, the first example is a declarative assertion. The speaker is talking to a basketball player. So those, uh, a lot of those seven plus hours of television was a soap opera about basketball. Um, <laughs> With a, with a title that was translated as hot shot, but in fact was something completely unrelated. Um, but in any case, so a lot of basketball examples. Um, so the speaker is talking to a basketball player about a difficult move that he performed, and she's never, she has no idea about his background. And so she says, you must have practiced a long time. So, or rather, she says, you practice very long time, Ba. So notice there's no must have. Right, this is just free translation. Um, so the effect here is confirmation seeking. She's, um, and, and also a bit of uncertainty because of course, why would you need confirmation if you were certain of the facts? Okay, a different example. This one is uh, an imperative directive. Um, this is where doctor informs a young man that they cannot save his grandmother and advises go in quickly, blah. And the effect here, it, this is not part, the effect is not part of the translation really, but the effect here is a little bit of softening. So it's not a, you know, go in quickly and I command you. It's more like a suggestion. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a politeness effect. Okay. Another example, this one also a declarative assertion like the first one, but a different context type. Um, and we found, uh, well, later. Um, so the speaker has never played basketball formally. And this coach is recruiting people for her team. And she asks, um, how well do you play? And he says, I mean, he has no idea, right? Because he has nothing to compare himself to. And he says, should be not bad, bah. So it really means should be pretty good, I, I guess. Right, so there is this, there's no confirmation seeking because, well, because it's pointless to seek confirmation from somebody who you know is ignorant of the matter, right? But there is this uncertainty. Um, okay, here's a final example um, of the core four examples and it is a commissive. Uh, notice I'm not saying what clause type it is. More on that later. Okay, the, so the speaker is told that he should donate more than the um, 100 bucks he originally pledged, and he says, well, then I donate 200 ba. And here, there is this feeling of, okay, well, if you really want to, fine. Okay, so here, I mean, we saw an example of that kind of contextual effect in the very first example of ba that I gave, right, with the, with the hearer begging to go and then go by would mean, well, okay, fine, if you must go. So that was with the imperative, this is with, with the commissive, but the effect is the same. The idea is that you get this feeling of that the speaker is reluctant to go ahead and, and donate or promise to donate. Right. Okay, so um, the summary of effects is as follows. Um, to the extent that the context raises expectation that the hero can and may provide approval or confirmation or somehow take responsibility for the anchor, um, then the effect is to solicit this confirmation or agreement. Now, when the context does not support that expectation, then you get different effects depending on whether um, you have prior approval or not. So if there is prior approval, then the effect is just to delay a bit. And so that conveys hesitation or, uh, or reluctance, or in some cases, just politeness. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, so that's the, um, um, I'll donate 200 effect. Otherwise, if there is no prior approval and you can't expect to get it in the future, the effect is just uncertainty or tentativeness. So, um, so you see this sort of predictable variation with context. <coughs> the, 
the effects are also gradients. So I presented four of the most sort of extreme examples we could find. Um, but you get a bit of reluctance here, a bit of hesitation there. So um, it's very, it really is very gradient. It's not a categorical distinction. Um, there's some politeness here and there um, that kind of emerges in these examples. So we, we conclude that all the signs point to um, the ultimate effect of the particle bar being due to pragmatic inference. Now, the proposal, informally, is that bar has a single underlying function, and that is to kind of abdicate responsibility for the anchor speech act. Um, so it transfers the authority for the conversational move represented by the anchor away from the speaker, and not necessarily into the hearer's court, but most likely into the hearer's court. Um, and so pragmatic reasoning then derives the gradient effects, whether to solicit hearer approval, or uncertainty, or reluctance, or whatever it might be. So, how to model that formally is the big question. Um, and to do that, we need a theory of clause types and of their effects, um, so that we can then modify those effects using bar and such things. So we need a model of conversation, and I'm going to build on a model of conversation previously proposed by a number of people um, that supports the effects of bar across the different types of anchors. Um, so a unified approach to clause types and a sort of metalinguistic key component to allow modification of, of speech acts. All right. Okay, fine. I have to, I have to mention decision theory. Um, so this will not play a huge role, but um, a little bit of a role. So agents in conversation can be thought to face decision problems they're trying to solve. Um, and you can think of decision problem as um, a tuple. Um, the first part of the tuple is probability function over the set of possible worlds, right? This could represent an agent's beliefs. So you'd need a couple of those for the speaker and for the hearer. Um, and these are private beliefs, not public commitments. Um, then you have a set of available actions or alternatives that each speaker is considering. And so actions are not widely sort of used elements in semantics and pragmatics, but maybe we should start considering them more seriously. Um, and then a utility function, which um, um, basically models preferences. And it's uh, uh, basically, it tells you how good is each action in a particular world, right? Okay. Now, Independently, we need a semantics of clause types that can kind of unify um, all the different types of clauses, the declaratives and the imperatives and the whatnot, um, because it's independently needed to model sentences that connect different types of clauses. So you have sentences like, if you want to, sing. So the if clause is a declarative, arguably. The then clause is an imperative. If Joe is going, will Mary go, right? You have the if clause is a declarative, the then clause is an interrogative. Um, sing, and I will dance. I don't care which. Right, so that's a conjunction of imperative and, and declarative. And even if we pile them all together, if we are accepted to the talent show, sing, and I will dance. Okay. So, um, so there were, you know, some semantics have been worrying about this for a little while. So now we also have a pragmatics reason to, to uh, try to have a unified theory. Um, right, so pragmatic inferences about speakers' communicative intentions rely on semantics. Um, and so at the semantics pragmatics interface, we need a model that represents beliefs, represents alternatives, and um, it represents preferences, one way or another. So I'm going to. Instead of inventing my own, I'll just take one from somebody else who's already thought about that. In particular, from a, uh, 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 Will Starr, um, um, who thought of it for the purposes of having a unified semantics for connectives. 
um, for sentences such as I just demonstrated. Okay, so to dive right into it, here is uh, Will Starr's semantics of assertion or dynamics of assertion. Um, I'm not going to go into like the nitty gritty of each actual update function that a declarative is supposed to represent, but you can see its effects. Um, the base content is a proposition, just like we're all used to modeling declarative um, um, assertions, and the typical effect is to eliminate worlds at which the content is not true. Okay, so this is all very familiar. Right. Oh my goodness, the gray alternatives are really not showing up at all. <sighs> so, there's supposed to be a partition separate. Okay, so um, um, can we raise this a little bit? Yeah. Oh, I see. Perfect. More, a little more, and enough. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I will have. Okay. So we have the four worlds. The worlds that support the proposition capital A um, are going to be represented, labeled with a capital A. The worlds that support the negation of A or don't support A will be small letter A. Uh, so the top worlds are all A worlds. The bottom worlds are not A worlds. And then we have a cross cutting with B worlds and not B worlds. Okay, so if you accept inquiry whether A, you basically get a partition. The top worlds, which are A worlds, from the bottom worlds, which are non-A worlds. Okay, great. So that's the effect. That's what you're supposed to see on the right there. <laughs> so you get a partition on the set of worlds. Okay, so, um, yeah. So this is accepting an inquiry of whether A is true. Oh, good, colors show up. So I don't need to try to represent colors using a chalkboard. Um, so uh, the warm color represents good. We pref prefer that over cold color. Okay, so um, basically ad accepting a directive in favor of A um, is like ranking A propositions over non-A propositions. Okay, so you get the top A worlds are ranked. Uh, yeah, the top worlds are ranked over the bottom worlds. Okay, so uh, under his proposal, imperatives based content is a ranking of propositions, a ranking of alternatives. And uh, the typical effect of an imperative is to introduce a preference corresponding to that ranking. All right. Now, actually, this is where actions might have come in useful, right? Because there is a natural way in which we can think of imperatives as denoting actions, right? As requesting that an action be performed. Um, so, uh, a, a few Zinun Bedeutungs ago, we had a proposal from Chris Barker. Um, that imperative's base content is actually a relation on worlds, a set of pairs of worlds which you can think of as a before and after picture, right? The world, the, f the left element of each pair is a world from the common ground and the right element of each pair is a world in which, um, which is just like the left one except the requested action has been performed in it. Okay. Um, I like that. Interesting, this is still the old version of my slides I just noticed. But no matter, the only difference is a few, a bullet point here and there. Um, okay, so I like that, but I haven't finished working out the unified semantics of clause types. Chris Barker's proposal only did imperatives and I need everything, so I will just stick with Will Stars. Okay, um, so we can kind of still think of the imperative's base content is an action as opposed to what Will says. Um, 
But then, of course, the typical effect would be to introduce a preference for the futures of common ground worlds where the action has been performed. So we collect the right elements of each pair into a proposition and we introduce a preference for that proposition. Okay, so what you get is a unified semantics of clause types is um, you get uh, a dynamic semantics which, um, in which each clause type um, is an update of the preference state. So the, it has three kinds of objects. Um, it's a set of preferences which are basically pairs of alternatives or propositions. Um, right, so the left proposition is preferred to the right proposition. Um, of course, that preference is defined over non-empty alternatives in those pairs. Um, and those are the issues at stake in the preference state. Um, and then, of course, at the bottom of it all is the set of worlds, which are live possibilities. And so that's the normal context set of live possibilities that we think of as the common ground. OK, so far, so good. So here is the unified semantics of clause types. This is taken with permission from Murray and Starr handouts, I mean, slides. Um, right, so the effect of declaratives is to eliminate non-A worlds from each alternative that is at stake. So if you start with that, um, the, um, then the effect would be just to eliminate non-A worlds. Um, for interrogatives, the idea is to introduce an issue where the A, and that means to introduce a partition. Um, so you get two pairs um, of things preferred over nothing. Um, and that just represents that partition that I have on the board here um, of A worlds over nothing and non-A worlds over nothing. Okay. Um, so that's not an actual preference, but it's just a way to have the same type of object. Right. Um, and finally, imperatives introduce an actual preference for A, and so we get that um, yellow and blue picture. Quite accidentally, the Ukrainian national colors. OK, um, or Swedish. All right, so the main claim, which is perfectly, I think, uncontroversial, is that we need to have a separation between semantics and pragmatics. So the unified dynamic semantics uh, models the dynamics of content, and that it is not sufficient as a model of what speakers do with that content, because they might be doing different things with the same content. Okay, so if we start, if we move in towards the realm of pragmatics, um, we can say that, okay, we'll start with the common ground, the normal Stolnikarian common ground, which is things we hold true for the purposes of the conversation. Um, and um, it's been modeled as the intersection of the participants' public discourse commitments. So things that everybody's committed to. Well. I'm just going to propose that it's not just the context set of worlds, but the whole preference state. That's going to be the target conversational state. And it includes worlds and issues and preferences and all of those semantic things that we've talked about. And um, this represents those, the information, the issues and the preferences that are jointly accepted by speaker and hearer for the purposes of the conversation. So, you can see how this is different from that decision problem that represents each speaker's private beliefs, private issues they're wondering about, and private preferences. Right? This is for the purposes of the conversation, so it's public, um, and, and that's private, but there is, of course, a flow between public and private information. Um, now, because it's jointly joint stuff, it has to be updated collaboratively. I cannot change what's in your head, and I likewise cannot change what your public commitments are like. Um, so initiating a proposal to update the target state will normally fall short of actually doing that. Um, OK, so here is the, we're coming to the crux of the matter, and that is that moves that fall short go to the table. 
which is basically means they fall short. They're up for negotiation. Um, they don't go and directly update the common ground. Um, so such a move can be thought of as a proposal for an update of the target. So not at issue aspects of a move do update the target directly. So when I speak, the words I'm saying and the intonation I'm using and these sort of aspects, uh, metalinguistic aspects, instantly enter the common ground because we're jointly attending, um, hopefully, um, to what I'm saying. <laughs> right. um, also, there's been proposals that things like a positives. John, who lives in California, is here. Um, so who lives in California directly updates the common ground according to Sarah Murray. Um, also, evidential propositions that um, what a tissue proposition is such that speaker has reportative evidence for it. The reportative evidence part just directly updates the common ground. Okay, so then at issue content, in contrast, gets to the target only when all interlocutors approve of it being there. So there has to be an uptake and acceptance. Um, right, and that's been already proposed. Um, so the discourse move that falls short of the target consists of actually of two parts. Um, one part is this entire preference state, representing the proposal of here's what I want the common ground to look like. And then there is this at issue-ness issue. Um, and so there is a pr propositional discourse referent identifying at issue content. So that's been proposed by Sarah Murray uh, before. Um, and so um, this provides a, so the, the, this um, entire preference state part. This provides a way for us to model meanings that refer to the proposed move. So meanings like ba, um, meanings that can modify what move is actually proposed. Um, at the same time, this, the table contains the propositional discourse referent identifying a tissue content, and this provides antecedents for an aphora such as yes and no, um, and maybe other things. Okay. Um, it might be possible to do a kind of cleaning up and a reduction so we don't have that many objects to keep track of. So it's likely that we can identify the at issue proposition from just looking at the proposed move. Um, but I'm not going to do it in this talk because that we, we need to be careful about reducing things so we don't reduce too much. Okay. So now if you look at it, then the proposed update, if you look at the two parts, the, the at issue proposition and the proposed move, that proposed update differs in degree of speaker commitment or preference for the discourse referent proposition. So if we look at the declarative assertions, the at issue proposition A is proposed to be added to the information in the common ground. It indicates, that indicates a high degree of commitment to it. So this way, just by kind of seeing what the proposed update is, the hearer can figure out what the public discourse commitments and likely the beliefs of the speaker are. Um, now, speakers expected involvement in getting the content to the actual target is minimal. All you need to do is accept possibly just do nothing and then we'll think that you accept it. Okay. If you look at a different example, here's an imperative directive, right? So again, it's, we start with the initial common ground that is a state of perfect ignorance, as, at least as far as proposition A is concerned. Um, and so the, the discourse referent is the same here. Um, well, it's actually the proposition that the hero will perform the requested action. I have a reason to believe that that's the referent proposition. Um, so there's been, when imperatives have been modeled as propositions, they've usually been modeled as propositions that are about obligations, 
right? So that an imperative do action X has been modeled as, imposing, uh, as basically a proposition, you should do X, right? I, that's not the proposition that I'm saying is at issue. I'm saying that the proposition that's at issue here is that the hero will actually perform the action. So it's the proposition collecting those worlds in which the imperative has been fulfilled. Um, so that also indicates a high degree of speaker's authority or commitment to that coming true. Um, and again, the speaker's expected involvement as far as updating the preferences in the target state is just acceptance. If you do nothing, or that will be thought of as implicit acceptance. Um, there's, not, there's not much that needs to be done there. Now, in summary, oh, actually first, let's connect things, connect the dots here. Um, so suppose the hero accepts the imperative preference, um, right, update. So then the preference for doing this requested action now enters the public commitments. So for the purposes of conversation, the hero now has a preference for A. Suppose the hero adopts this preference for her own private decision making, right? I'm not going to get into decision theory too closely here, but if this preference is not dominated by other interfering preferences, this action then becomes optimal for the hero in the hero's private decision making. Okay. So then the rational hero will be expected to choose that action and do it and make that proposition true. The proposition that the hero will do the action. Okay. So in a way, if, if your imperatives denote preferences, you need all of those pragmatic steps to get to that proposition that the hero will perform the action. If imperatives just denoted actions, you could very easily get to that proposition. You just collect the right elements of, of each pair, right? And you get the world, the worlds in which the action has been performed. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons I really want to adopt actions as my semantics of imperatives, if I can do it. <laughs> or if somebody else can do it. I'm happy with that. Um, right, so in summary of the declarative and imperative updates, the table proposes that the at issue proposition become part of the information on the preferences in the common ground. Okay, it doesn't contain any kind of incompatibilities, um, the here is expected engagement is minimal, it's just acceptance. So this kind of proposal is really is the best you can do short of actually getting to update the common ground directly. Right? So when I'm saying a declarative, the only reason I'm not at the target is because I can't change what's in your head. But as long as you indicate that you're okay with that, voila, it's at the target. Um, and same with imperatives. Right, I can't make you have a preference for doing an action, but the moment you say, okay, fine, um, right, it's, it's, it's now um, done, it's updated. Okay, things are different with questions. I said they would be different with questions and sure enough they are. Um, so look at the polar interrogative. Um, is A true or something like that? Um, so the discourse referent is the same as before, um, right? So we have, um, this is uh, following Farkash and Bruce and Farkash and Rulofsson, all these um, proposals that when you have a polar interrogative such as is the door open, then the door being open is the at issue proposition here. Um, and that sort of sits on top of that partition between the open door worlds and non-open door worlds. Okay, um, now notice that a question whether the door is open is also a proposal 
to eventually, sort of several steps ahead, to update the common ground with either the proposition that the door is open or the proposition that the door is closed or not open, whatever. Right? Yet a question is not actually a proposal to do one of those. Right? So I'm expressing no commitment to the door being open by just asking a question. I'm just putting it up as a discourse referent, but I'm not expressing any commitment to it. Okay. What? Okay. So we can distinguish moves based on the level of conveyed speaker authority and expected hearer engagement in advancing the at issue proposition towards the target preference state. So with the polar questions, of course, the hearer engagement is much more than minimal. In order to advance the proposition that the door is open to the common ground, the hearer act actually needs to assert it, right? Or that the door is not open, whichever. Right, so the hearer engagement that's sought by a question is, is huge um, by comparison to a declarative or imperative. So we can model that as, uh, by sort of dividing our table um, into the part where the hearer is actually fully engaged and is making decisions about content that goes towards the target state versus just like nodding his head. Okay. Um, so putting the table, the proposal on this table one, which I sort of label as the part where you make choices, um, this establishes conversational goals, which this is model as choice of one or more updates. Um, this is sort of similar to raising an issue or question under discussion um, in the sense of Roberts 96. And it does so without proffering that issue proposition as information or preference to be added to the common ground. You can still deduce that there is some degree of speaker commitment, like say in a biased question. But that's just extra deduction on the part of the hearer. Um, it doesn't have to be there. Right, and so here's, an, uh, to emphasize the difference uh, between table one moves and table two moves, questions recruit addressee involvement in decisions about potential updates, and so there are these table one choices moves. There's the other part, which is what I call table two proffer, where a single update is proffered to be added to the information or the preferences in the common ground, okay? So, so that's sort of the part that's the next best thing to actually reaching the target. So, at a glance, that's, that's my whole view of the world, or rather view of conversational scoreboard, at a glance. So, we have this, the most important part is this arrow, which is this expected progress of conversation. Everything moves towards the target. We all expect to eventually update the common ground with one of those things. And so, when you assert something, you add information that a to the common ground. When you issue a directive, you add preference for A to the common ground. When you ask a question, a polar question of whether A, you add issue whether A or not A to the common <coughs> ground, but also on the other part of the table, you add, propose to add information that A, or propose to add information that not A to the common ground. So here's a preview. Bar assertion is going to propose to add information that A to the common ground, but do it on that other part of the table, which indicates a higher level of hearer engagement and a lower level of speaker authority. <coughs> and that, that's what the proposal is going to be. Oh, wow. <coughs> Okay, so Bob marks the update conveyed by the anchor as destined for that more involved, farther away from the target part of the conversational model. Um, it presupposes that the update conveyed by the anchor proffers this at issue proposition as info preference to be added to the common ground. So that it's a table two move, that it would be otherwise very close to the target, except Ba is what holds it back.
So basically, a speaker may direct a move to any stage along this continuum, along this path indicated by that giant arrow. And so the update cannot really be derived from utterance denotation. That's the separation between semantics and pragmatics. So, there is, it's expected that the speaker will actually move stuff as far along as she possibly can. So when a speaker doesn't do that, when the speaker does not get the content as far as it can go, then that triggers implicatures, um, such as reluctance and certainly deference. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment, right? So the expectation that the content will move along that path drives pragmatic inferencing. So let's go back to actual examples. Phew. Um, right, so when you say you practice very long time bar, right, this represents a move to that table one choices part of the table to add this proposition that you practiced a very long time to the information in the common ground, right? Um, or go in quickly bar, right? Add preference for going in quickly to the common ground. Um, and the expectation is that the hearer will advance content from this, you know, towards the target if, if possible. So then you get this confirmation seeking effect. Like I'm actually asking for your input on whether you want to go in or not, right? The, the preferences are somewhat up to you. And likewise, I'm asking your, for your input on whether you practiced a long time. Right, so here the context is such that the hearer can reasonably be expected to advance the content towards the target. And so the hearer inference is that the speaker is willing to commit once the hearer actually goes ahead and moves that content towards the common ground. And this suggests the need for approval or confirmation, either due to uncertainty or due to politeness or whatever. Reasons could be numerous. Um, look at the other example, right? The example where the speaker has just been asked a question of how well he plays. And so we know that the hearer has no idea how well he plays at all. So he says, should be not bad, Ba. So that's a, a table one move to add this proposition that should be not bad to the common ground. So the hearer has asked a question, cannot reasonably be expected to advance the content. Speaker is not also willing to get it any nearer to the target than table one. It, this suggests really epistemic uncertainty about <coughs> the proposition, right? Can't be, there's no other reason really to not advance it. Okay, here's a context where we have prior approval. So again, it's a move to table one choices to add preference for donating 200 bucks. Um, and the hero has pre-approved the donating of more money, really. Um, so seeking approval is actually redundant. Um, so the hero inference is that the speaker expects to become committed, right? Because that's what table one moves are. Um, but chooses not to proffer the update directly. Uh, sorry, that's not because of what table one moves are. It's because there is a single proposition, the at issue discourse referent proposition that's being proposed as an update. Um, but somehow chooses not to move it along as far along as possible, so that suggests reluctance. I just want to delay committing. So conclusion so far is that bomb modifies a conversational move, but signaling by signaling that the speaker is not willing to take full responsibility for the proposed update. Um, this gives us a unified treatment of bar, and the idea is that we have this overall structure of how the model works, and that drives implicatures. Basically, we expect people to um, take full responsibility for what they say and uh, really move it as far along towards the common ground as they possibly can, and when they don't, that's unusual and we're surprised and we start drawing inferences. Okay. Um, so, on to payoff. 
and nice things that follow. Okay, so ba only modifies the direct update of the anchor. So when you have something like, I need a pen, that can serve as an indirect request for a pen, but not when you add ba. I mean, it can st I mean it's kind of a little weird. It's asking, it's asking confirmation or expressing uncertainty about whether I need a pen. I mean, it's it maybe not weird. It could be like you're standing at the hotel registration desk and you're like, oh, I need a pen, do I? Another consequence, interrogatives are not requests generally. Generally. In general. Okay, so by is generally bad with interrogatives. Um, it's actually completely ungrammatical with uh, yes or no questions, unfortunately. Um, and that is because um, it occupies the same syntactic position as the question, yes or no question particle ma. Um, so you can't have both. Very strongly ungrammatical. But there are other ways of forming questions, so it's okay with WH questions. Um, it's some speaker, we get, can get speakers to accept it with WH questions, with alternative questions. Uh, with A not A questions. Um, specifically, it becomes acceptable to some speakers, not all speakers, um, in so-called impatient scenarios. So the one scenario is, f imagine um, a car salesman and you're talking to this car salesman and um, you're wondering how much this particular car costs. And the, he keeps talking about how great it is. And it has this feature and that feature and finally you go, how much is this car, ba, right? And so this gets this very impatient tone. Like, how much is this car? Or come on, tell me how much this car is. Don't, you know, waste my time here. <laughs> I have other examples if you're interested. So I'm gonna claim that ba presupposes that its anchor is not already a table one move. So by is generally bad with questions, right? Because questions are, in part, table one moves. Um, but in the okay example, there is an implicit imperative. That's what I'm going to say. That it actually is, tell me, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and hence, the question gets strengthened into a request. Uh, but that's a lot of implicit material to assume. So it's only okay when the scenario is very crystal clear. Another consequence, performative verbs and models may or may not be just plain assertions. Okay, so if you say you should give me a pen without the bar, that could be a performative model in the sense that it imposes an obligation rather than describing an obligation, right? So if I have the proper authority, I can tell you, you should give me a pen. And that's a request for a pen that imposes an obligation. Um, but if you say you should give me a pen bar, it doesn't mean you should give me a pen softening the request. You might expect that it would do that because it does that with imperatives. Um, it could be sort of like, give me a pen, please. But it doesn't do that. Side note, notice that in English you can't say you should give me a pen, please. Somehow there is a bit of a conflict between should and please. But let's not go into please yet. Um, so you should give me a pen, shouldn't you, is the only meaning that people get. Not, how about you give me a pen. So it loses the performativity. Similarly with um, performative verbs, uh, I'm naming this ship the dragon, am I not? <laughs> right, you don't get the suggestion flavor, right? Yeah, it is weird. <laughs> It's like, don't you know? Okay, um, yeah, so it's quite bad. So one explanation for this is that sentences with performative verbs or performative models are actually just direct assertions. And so that's the typical effect that Ba has on assertions is to solicit confirmation or express uncertainty about them, um, right? And then performativity actually emerges indirectly and Ba only modifies the direct update so it only modifies the assertion part. There is an alternative explanation, darn it. Um, sentences with performative verbs or models could be just the wrong type to combine with ba. So there is a proposal in the literature by Anna Sabalucci that they just denote actions. They just change the world 
from one before the performative to one where the performative has been issued. And so, um, or they could be direct CG updates rather than proposals, so Bob doesn't have anything to operate on. We'll need to sort out which one it is. Okay. Another consequence potentially is that supposing that performatives are just direct assertions, right? So then this is additional confirmation that Ba only modifies the direct update of the anchor. But Mandarin has anchors with Ba that update preferences regarding speaker action, like I donate 100 or 200 dollars, Ba is fine. And you get a lot of these examples. And there's a lot of hoarded of examples where there's a joint action by speaker and hearer that comes with Ba. Could this be that this indicates that there are commissive and hoarded of clause types in Mandarin? Maybe, possibly. There's not too much syntactic evidence for any of that. But it's hard, I mean, looking for syntactic evidence for stuff in Mandarin is hard. Right, so here's an example. We together go eat ba. Right, it's not, so this is very different from I need a pen ba. This is not I need a pen, do I? This is how about we go eat together. Okay, another payoff um, is that actually, I'm gonna just give you a preview. Reverse polarity tags work exactly the same way. Okay, so, right? Um, and very differently from rising intonation. <laughs> okay. So you get all these contexts where RP tags are okay, right? Informed here, a speaker seeking agreement, also somewhat inform informed speaker, um, or uninformed bias speaker seeking confirmation and informed here. Um, it's not in there, is it? Or that has to do with speci speciation, doesn't it? This is from Michigan Corpus of Academic Spoken English, so these are some very confused students. <laughs> um, right, so RP tags are bad when the speaker is totally, completely uninformed, has no reason to think that the proposition is true. Okay, so when Alice says, you've got to see this picture of my new neighbor, and Bob, without, crucially, without looking at the picture, says, he's attractive, isn't he? That's just not, that doesn't work as an innuendo. You can say he's attractive, is he? Or you can say he's attractive, right? But you c it, the RP tag is actually quite robustly bad. Um, it's also infelicitous when it's truly, truly, truly metalinguistic. I've been using kind of this word metalinguistic move a little bit too freely. RP tags and ba actually are not truly metalinguistic. Um, because when you are absolutely sure about the content and you're just unsure, say, whether your move is relevant um, or whether that's the information that the hearer is looking for or, some, some other, or, or whether you're pronouncing words correctly. Any other metalinguistic issue that has nothing to do with the content, these things are bad. So you can't say, hi, my name is Mark Lieberman, isn't it? To modify a <laughs> classic example of a rising declarative, which was perfectly fine here, right? So you can say, my name is Mark Lieberman, when you're approaching, a, say, a receptionist somewhere and you're not sure that that's the way she wants to identify you, um, right? So we checked all of these example types with Mandarin informants um, and did some corpus study of RP tags and so far, Bob with declaratives is exactly like RP tags, reverse polarity tags. So RP tags, we're gonna say, have the same exact underlying function as Ba, except they just do it with declaratives. Or do they? Um, so, how about this construction? I, I, I hear that a lot. Open the door, will you? No, I won't. So, this no, right? There's the claims that what no does is it takes that at issue proposition and it denies it. Here's our clue that the at issue proposition with imperatives is that the hearer will do it. Because it's no, I won't. Right, so this is the proposition that's being referred to here. Um, 
So you get reverse polarity attacks with imperatives too. Open the door, won't you? Yet to be tested as far as how they, whether they behave exactly as imperatives with BA. Um, so notice there's a, a special thing for just actions and, or preferences, whichever, and that's okay. Okay is a word that is only good, well, I want to claim. Not 100% sure about that one. Um, but yeah, marry your mother, will you? Says somebody to Oedipus, right? Okay, I will, right? I mean, compare that to the declarative assertion, right? You will marry your mother. Okay, I will. Ew, yeah, that's weird, right? As opposed to, you will marry your mother. Yes, I will, the Pythia already told me. Right? I've heard that prophecy before. <laughs> I guess. Bah. Um, okay, so, right? So the et issue proposition is really the here will do it. Um, and possibly reverse polarity tags are just like bah if we keep going with them far enough. Okay, future directions are endless, but let me finish by suggesting that we um, can gain insight into conditionals by possibly analyzing things like please as conditional if you please. Or maybe table one moves as something like if hearer approves, right? Um, there are important differences between regular indicative conditionals, relative conditionals, and bar moves. Um, to give you one difference, um, regular indicative conditionals introduce conditional obligations Relevance conditionals don't. They just introduce regular obligation. So bar moves are not like relevance conditionals, although they do operate at the speech act level. Very interesting. Um, proper treatment of commissives in English. Right? Um, a commissive like I will donate 200 bucks. Right? That involves a commitment to the future proposition that I will, but it's not just about, right? So let Oedipus and his mother is really a perfect test example. I will marry my mother could be a promise. Or it could be just a description of what I've been told by these prophecies, um, right? And this is about commitments versus preferences. The OK test shows that commissives involve actions or preferences, and yet they're declaratives in English. Right, so maybe not all declaratives update just the information. Maybe some declaratives update preferences. Um, yeah, interesting. Non-directive uses of imperatives are the same way, right? So here we have non-assertive uses of declaratives, say for promises. Same thing with non-directive uses of imperatives, right? So threats, cross this line and you'll regret it. That does not update here of preferences to include in favor of crossing the line. In fact, quite the opposite, um, right? Um, maybe actions will help us here. Of course, compositional analysis of RP tags would be great. Um, and of course, please is a fascinating word and it's Russian translational equivalent, which are quite different. Um, rising intonation is a whole nother can of worms, but it's a very related can of worms. Um, and if you know people who are good at analyzing intonation, please, please get me in touch with them. <laughs> because I don't know the first thing. Okay, the end.